And welcome back, everybody. Uh, thank you for joining us. Like I said, either uh, good morning or good afternoon, uh, depending on where you happen to be in the world. <coughs> uh, excuse me. My name is Jason Hodger with PCI Geomatics, and I'm really happy to be uh, hosting today in uh, a presentation that uh, we put together on the uh, the new Python capability in Geomatic 2014. Um, this is a really exciting new feature that we have in our latest uh, version of Geomatica, and in uh, in previous versions of Geomatica, you've always had a we've always had a scripting environment uh, that you may or may not be familiar with called Easy. But uh, what's what's really exciting about uh, using Python, this open source available uh, scripting language, is what it allows you to. Uh, to, to, to script together your, your geomatic workflows into other other applications outside of Geomatica and we have a, a, an excellent presentation put together demonstrating exactly how to do some of these things. So I'll just move along somewhere quickly and we'll get to the presentation shortly. I just wanted to mention a, a few things about the logistics of a webinar in case you're uh, you're unfamiliar with uh, the interface here. Uh, all your lines are muted during the course of this presentation. Um, type questions into the questions panel that you have. Um, and if you're not seeing the interface the way it is on my screen, it's likely nested against the right side of your monitor there, and you'll see some buttons that will, will pop out different panels for you. Um, if you do want it, we will be having a, a dedicated question and answer session at the at the end of the uh, the presentation. But uh, by all means, uh, enter the questions in the box as, as soon as you think of them so you don't forget them, and we can queue them up appropriately as they come in. Uh, lastly, this session is being recorded. I am recording it right now, so uh, we will be uh, delivering a recorded version of this along with the slides in the in the coming days. So you can uh, watch it again or share it amongst your friends and uh, and and really see what's uh, been going on in case you miss anything during the live presentation. Uh, presenting today on the left, we have me. I uh, am the marketing specialist here at PCI Geomatics, and I am located just outside of Ottawa, Canada, in Gatineau. And uh, putting together the presentation today is uh, Sean Malamud, application specialist. He is uh, in Toronto, Canada, right now. And uh, Sean has a, a wealth of experience in, uh, in geomatics, knows almost everything there is to know about Geomatica software and its applications, and has worked with a, a number of clients and, uh, and, and customers of ours uh, for, for a number of years, uh, really working on the, the real-world applications of, of Geomatica. So Sean is, a, is, is definitely our Geomatica expert. He is absolutely our Python expert, and he has put together a, an excellent presentation and demonstration uh, for us all to see here. Uh, before we get to that, though, I just want to run very quickly through um, this webinar is actually the last in a series that we've we've been doing since uh, since later uh, since late summer, just a, a month or so ago, and it's a number of applications ba basically on how you can integrate imagery into uh, a number of GIS applications for 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 different re real world situations, and all of these are available on our website, and a link that I'm just going to send out now. Um, all of these and more are available at uh, pcigmax.com slash resources dash support slash more resources slash webinars. And uh, these are uh, really a, a really good series that we've had a lot of success with and a lot of great feedback. So uh, this one here we're looking at now is a, is a mining and construction information here. And uh, what, uh, what, what we were able to put together is a, a couple of... Uh, by, by looking at by deriving digital elevation models and comparing those over over different dates, uh, we were calculating the volume of these uh, stockpiles of different uh, minerals and and, uh, and things that have been extracted out of the ground, or perhaps it's uh, construction stores and things like that. Um, <clears throat> so that's a really excellent one if you're interested in in, in that. Then we delivered a webinar on uh, another information extraction one. This one is, is about uh, uh, agriculture, and this one we delivered in conjunction with Blackbridge Geomatics, the owners of the Rapid Eye constellation of satellites. And, and what is unique about that constellation is uh, the red edge band, which as you can see up in the chart here, sits, sits between the red and the near infrared. And uh, it's, a very good, uh, it's a very good indicator uh, of, of chlorophyll levels. In, uh, in vegetation. 
So you can see what we're we're looking at here. We're comparing it to uh, a, a couple of fields, and uh, by by running a number of the of algorithms in Geomatica uh, using uh, rapid eye imagery, uh, we can determine which plants are uh, are healthy or which ha which plants are are getting sparse, and and determine uh, better courses of action to investigate uh, sending your field units to appropriate locations at appropriate times. Uh, another one, a new a new product that we uh, have just in the in the past year or so is is 3D feature extract, and uh, we've put together a webinar on on how to use this tool as well as a tool that Esri has put together. We we delivered this webinar with Esri, uh, their tool called City Engine, and uh, both of these tools uh, derive 3D building models out of uh, stereo imagery, which is which is really unique and a, a much simpler way to to build 3D 3D building models than, than previously thought. And uh, depending on the level of detail required, um, you can uh, we show use cases on how you can do this with the, either the Esri City Engine project or uh, our uh, the the 3D feature extract product that we uh, that we deliver. And most recently, uh, we we put together a webinar that we co-delivered again with uh, McDonald Weiler and Associates, uh, MDA here in here in Canada. And uh, this is a uh, more information extraction, a, a disaster response example. Um, and we did a number of uh, examples in this webinar, but the one you're seeing here is a, a flooded area that floods quite regularly uh, in Western Canada near Winnipeg. And um, what we're able to do using radar imagery with its rapid revisit time and its its all weather day and night uh, capabilities is uh, take a look at the the flood extents, comparing that against uh, uh, a, a non flooded time, a dry period, and uh, and and taking that and intersecting it with uh, with road vectors uh, that are available to to find out routes for emergency vehicles to take and what roads need to be closed in a municipal level and all that. So there's a lot of interesting things here. We've put together a lot of webinars, and I hope uh, you know if you like what you've seen today and you haven't seen the webinars that we put on earlier in the month, that uh, be free to feel free to check them out in the link that I sent there. Now that is just about it for me. I'm going to launch one poll today. Uh, we like to we like to have these polls to make sure that we're delivering uh, the right version of software to you and the right tools, and make sure that we're delivering value to you. So I'm going to launch this poll while I pass control to Sean and he gets his demonstration set up. And basically, uh, the the poll. Uh, that we're looking at right now is uh, what version of Geomatica are you currently using? Uh, specifically, I ask this because uh, the the capability that Sean will be demonstrating today is a new feature in uh, Geomatica 2014, the most recent version. Um, so if you if you like what you see and you want to try out some of the things that that, that Sean has put together here, um, you will need to be using uh, Geomatica 2014. Uh, and if you don't have it, we do have a free trial available that you can download at getgeomatica.com. Excellent. Many people have voted. Uh, a full 50% of the people out there are on the newest version of Geomatica 2014, so that's great. You'll be able to jump in right away with the demonstration and uh, and, and maybe replicate uh, some of the things that, that Sean has done today. And others are sort of... Uh, using either legacy versions and a few people out there aren't using Geomatic at all. So hopefully what we show you today can uh, can get you on board uh, with Geomatica and you can start uh, getting more from imagery. So uh, with that, I'm going to pass it on to Sean officially now to uh, put together the presentation. Uh, go ahead, Sean. Oh, thank you very much, Jason. So just a moment while we get set up with the screen here. Okay, so everyone should be seeing my screen now and uh, I'm showing a PowerPoint slide. So we're just going to go through a few different PowerPoint slides to provide a little bit of background about our Python capability as well as the uh, specific workflows that we're going to be demonstrating here. But we're also going to spend a fair amount of time doing some live demonstrations. So the purpose of this webinar really is to give you some ideas as to what you can do with our um, Geomatica as a platform and beginning to think of it as 
a set of libraries or a set of tools for building custom solutions. And specifically in this uh, presentation, we're going to focus on our integration capabilities and customization capabilities, but specifically our integration capabilities with ArcGIS. So let's take a quick look at the platform. So the concept that we're uh, that we're uh, mentioning here is Geomatica as a platform. So it's no longer thinking about Geomatica as a desktop software where you have a predefined set of tools and functions and workflows and you have to work with that. So what we're trying to show here is that you can actually build very customized solutions and then begin to sell GIS and remote sensing solutions to non-GIS and non-remote sensing users. So to think about that, that really increases the uh, your market size as you can now begin to create final products that you don't necessarily need to be a GIS or remote sensing specialist to be able to interpret. And we're going to show some examples of that as we go through our demonstrations. But first let's talk about what we've done here. So what does this really mean? And what this means is that we've included Python as a part of Geomatica now. So this means that you can now integrate your all the different algorithms and workflows that you may have built in the past or uh, ones that you want to build in the future with our tool sets and you can directly input them into your GIS workflows. This also, or what this also brings to you is the ability, or what this really means is that we've included Python as a, a Python API for our over 550 geospatial high-level um, processing algorithms or functions, which we also call PPFs. So these are high-level uh, functions that do very specific geospatial processing tasks. Now, in, this, in our service pack release, which is coming out very soon, we are also going to be included extended support, which is going to provide access to specific objects like raster objects, and bitmap objects, and what this is going to do is it's going to give you a lot more um, capabilities to define your own models and really begin to take advantage of the power and modeling capabilities. So in the end, this allows you to build more powerful, more automated solutions as you can use our libraries and begin to combine them with the libraries of other um, products. So this leads us nicely to why did we choose Python? So why Python as the sort of the language, the scripting language that's going to glue together all of this? Well, there's a couple different reasons. One is there is a major advantage of working with Python from a just a simplistic, sim, uh, simple point of view, simplicity point of view. So really, uh, it's a very user-friendly, it's a high-level scripting language. You can begin to build some very powerful applications without uh, a significant amount of education in the matter, without a specific significant amount of training. So you can get started very quickly. Another key factor is that Python is continuing to grow as an important programming language out there. So there's a lot of resources, a lot of online references for just being able to do some general as well as some very um, complex uh, tasks within Python and then you can also there's a lot of other geospatial libraries that have access to Python so you can really begin to build some powerful solutions. So Python uh, can be used to create very simple scripts as we're going to show. It can also be used to create very complex workflows including uh, the concept of adding uh, your own graphical interfaces. And it really what it is, it's the glue that connects all of your functions together to create your workflows between different software packages. So Python, here's some statistics. So Python is one of the most widely used and talked about programming languages on the market. So if we look at this uh, table here, we can see that Python is just below C++, JavaScript, PHP, so on in terms of um, how much it's used and talked about on the internet. It's number seven amongst languages for how much it's referenced on the web. So it's right up there with some of the key languages. 
and it has a huge open source library. So you can see over here, Python. So what this means by an open source library is that there's a lot of things, so a lot of code has already been built with Python, that you can then just take that code or import those libraries into your own and basically immediately start to take advantage of those capabilities. I'm a strong believer in not reinventing the wheel. So wherever possible, I will look to see if somebody else has built a concept or built a function already before I go and build it myself. And there's a big market demand for Python, and it's continuing to grow. So it's not yet the uh, one of the biggest ones, or the, the biggest here in the list, but it's on the list. It's even above C. It's above ASP. So it's growing as a uh, marketable, um, a marketable uh, language, especially within the geospatial industry. It's a very marketable language within the geospatial industry. And this leads me to the last point about the Python advantage, is that there's a lot of great commercial and open source geospatial packages out there that you can already begin to take advantage of. And this is just a small selection of what's available out there. So we have our Geomatica one, obviously ArcGIS, and then there's also some open source one here, such as CardoPy, SciPy, NumPy. These are some very useful um, libraries that you can begin to take advantage with geospatial packages. All right, so let's take a look at some Python basics. So the Python basics that we want to take uh, that we want to consider is just getting started. So for those of you who have never really worked with Python before, uh, let's take a quick look at to some of the key concepts about uh, what some things you need to know before you get started. So syntax how is the program interpreted? How is it read? This is basically, um, this is important as every coding language has a different syntax. So you, you need to learn the syntax, but once you understand the syntax, the basic constructs of the code are the same. So for example, one important rule here is the indentation rules. So Python is one of the only language, if not the only language, that interprets indentations. So indentations are read by Python um, by the compiler in order to identify blocks of code. So specific, uh, for example, uh, for loops, if statements, functions, objects, and it uses the indents to identify this. So I'll explain that in a, bit, a bit more in depth. And what the value that this brings is that indents, by forcing the user or the developer to indent their code, is it helps make it much more human readable. So it's much easier to go back to your old code and begin to understand what you did, or if you have to read somebody else's code for you to be able to quickly understand what they're doing. And Python's, uh, so really it addresses two requirements at once, as it keeps it clean, and it also minimizes the amount of lines you need. So here's an example. So for, if we look over here, and I hope you can see my mouse, we can see at our main, uh, at the character zero, or at the first character, we can see that there's no indenting out. So this is all in line. But then for when we indent here, everything that's been indented under this if condition is basically a part is going to be evaluated if this is true. And then it even gets, and then you can even indent again and have additional what we call nested conditions. So if this is satisfied what within this block of code, then this will be printed. And one thing that you also should notice is that there is no end if. So the way that it knows to close this if statement is to indent back out, to go back to character one or the first character. So meaning this print goodbye line here, line 15, is not a part of this block. It's the first piece of code that is seen outside of this block.
Okay, so another key aspect about the syntax is declaring and defining variables. Now, variables only need to be defined, not declared in Python. That's, and in my opinion, that's huge. That makes it so much easier to build your a quick script when you just need when you can when you just need to define the variable. So. I think Python is also one of the only languages, if not the only language, that does not require variables to be declared. So Python is intelligent enough to automatically determine the data type of the variable that is being defined. So I know there's a lot of uh, um, terminology being thrown around here, so let's just take a quick peek at what this means. So declaring and defining a variable. Now here's two examples. In this first example, we have, uh, we're, uh, we're using Python and we're declaring and defining the variable at the same time. So we're simply saying x equals 5. Now Python is smart enough to say, okay, 5 is a number and there's no decimals, so we're going to store 5 as an integer. So it's going to declare x to be an integer variable. Now if we look at the block of code below in C++, it doesn't have that built in. The user has to explicitly declare the variable before, you def before they define it. So I have to tell the code that I want x to be interpreted as an integer and then I can define x to equal 5. So it just, it seems like a, a, a minute or a, min, or a minimal um, value, but it's actually very useful because you can think about, you can have many, many uh, variables. You can have global variables and local variables and it becomes, can become very uh, sometimes annoying in my opinion when you always have to go back up to the top and declare your variable. So here's some other important aspects that we're going to go through in this webinar. So it's looking at Python libraries. So the power and usability of any language really depends on the supporting libraries out there as well as the documentation of those supporting libraries. So one of the things that makes Python so valuable is number one, just in general, there's a lot of open source and a lot of code snippets and a lot of commercial um, packages that have a Python API or Python libraries. And in our case specifically, Geomatica and ArcMap both provide libraries for geospatial and vector and raster processing. So we can take advantage of these libraries and very, very quickly begin to build solutions. So a library is quite, the way we import a library is very simple. We just say from and the specific folder where that file can be found, or sorry, the, uh, the file itself, the, the Python file, and then we just go import. So we can do import star. Now it's not necessarily best practice to do import star, as what that's going to do is it's going to import all the functions. Usually it's better to import the specific function you need or objects you need, but in this case we're just doing them all. And as you can see here, we have the uh, example for ArcGIS as well. So it's the same thing. All right, so let's take a look at Geomatica and ArcGIS as a platforms. So what does that mean as them as platforms? Well, really, in an, if we had to put one thing to define this, it's quite simple. PCI's geoprocessing algorithms can now be inserted directly into your ArcGIS workflows or other workflows if you're using open source. But we're specifically going to focus on some examples with ArcGIS. So some of the advantages is Geomatica's, we're well known and we're even, we're Esri's gold partner and uh, provider of choice for performing image and raster uh, processing and analysis. So. We are their uh, image processing uh, company of choice for doing their imagery. And 
ArcGIS provides the advantage that they have some very powerful vector processing and analysis tools, amongst other processing and analysis tools. So by combining the two libraries, we've now just gone from only geomatic, the power of Geomatica, for example, or only the power of ArcGIS, and now we've combined the two libraries. Now we can take advantage of both libraries, as well as more if we want to. So our libraries in, uh, in Geomatica are called PCI Pluggable Frameworks, PPFs for now. Um, and they're basically geospatial, high-level geospatial functions that can be accessed through Python. And we can also think of Arc toolboxes as ArcGIS as geoprocessing functions that can be accessed through Python. So if we take a look, by using the libraries from both these two different packages, we can create a single script that can call ArcGIS functions and Geomatica functions and go back and forth between the two and pass information between the two. So what this looks like, and if we had to summarize this, is that you basically need to start also, if you're looking at the platform concept, uh, obviously there's a couple ways you can look at it. Maybe you just want to make your life a little bit easier. So you want to be able to script certain things and begin to automate certain mundane tasks that you have to do every day. Or perhaps you want to start selling solutions to end users, to non-GIS, non-remote sensing specialists. So this, the way you need to begin to think is in the terms of a problem and a solution. And then begin to th uh, figure out what tools you have available using, say, Geomatica's um, sphere of tools or ArcGIS's sphere of tools or the different open source libraries. And you begin to plug them into your code and you go from your problem and you solve a solution. So you don't think about it as a, um, as a desktop product necessarily anymore only. You can also think about it as a specific solution. And technically, we're going to show an example here, a demonstration, where we're going to run through uh, um, a, we're going to open up a GUI that we built and it's not going to show any branding from Geomatic or ArcGIS. It's just going to call the functions as we say, in the background or under the hood. Okay, so another important thing before we start going into some of our live demonstrations in terms of a background is understanding the APIs for both these software packages. So an API is an application programming interface and it basically gives the user through documentation and through functions and arguments and and objects um, provides the user with instructions of how to access uh, the different um, objects, attributes, and functions. So it's a set of, um, it's a wrapper basically that allows you to access and call functions from different libraries. So both PCI and ESRI have, or ESRI, have developed uh, Python APIs for Geomatica and ArcMap respectively, or ArcGIS respectively. Now, an important note, if you would like to begin programming um, with these two packages and you want to start building solutions that use both Geomatica and ArcGIS's um, APIs or libraries, you need to install um, the 64-bit um, background geoprocessor. So that's because ArcGIS 10.2.1 by default is still 32-bit. Th and Geomatica 2014 by default is 64-bit. So in order for the two software libraries to play nicely together, you need to install the 64-bit background processes. So um, with, once that's installed, then we can begin to take advantage and use the, two, um, the functions from both packages back and forth. And this also means that we need to call the special 60 or the 64-bit version of ArcGIS Python. We can also set this in our environment variable, in our path variable for our environment. All right, so let's let's really begin to understand what does this mean, these APIs. So how can we begin to understand these? So one, we have this. So everyone here uh, who are, is an ArcGIS user 
is likely familiar with the toolboxes that ArcGIS has and the various modules. So these are probably things that you've seen before, even if you've never programmed before. Well, we actually call these, in the simplest form, we can call these functions in, um, in a very similar way to the way we would do it GUI, uh, graphically. So let's take a look at the similarities. One, we would import ArcPy, which is basically importing the library. This is like accessing the toolboxes. We're then going to check out our licensing for our 3D analyst tools. This will allow us to have access to the different tools within 3D analyst. We can then set, specify our parameters. We can set them as variables. And finally, we launch the process, or in this case, we call the function and pass the parameters or pass the variables through as arguments. Now, Geomatica works much in the same way. Geomatica, we have here where we will uh, import our specific auto DEM function in this example. So this is our, from our module librarian. We then set our parameters. And finally, we run or we call our function and pass the parameters through as arguments. So, very simple. I mean, really, you can get start getting, uh, start working with it immediately. So, this is a nice point where we're going to start to go into the live demonstrations. So, the first thing we want to do is we just want to show you how simple it is that, uh, to get going. So there's a couple different places where you can access the Python consoles or begin to submit Python code. So one place for doing such is directly within Focus. So we have a Python interpreter here. So we can go to Tools, we can go to Python Scripting, and then we can begin to, for example, um, import or run some, run some scripts. So I can go Import or so, for example, from PCI dot we'll call it link import star. And what we're going to do here very quickly is a very first initial example is we're just going to create a link file. So we'll go to our raw data. And the other thing too, if you want to access the help, one nice place, you can go to help, general. Go to search, and if we want to look for the link information about link, we can go here. We can click on the Python, and it gives us our Python help. So it tells us, for example, what we need to pass. We have three arguments we need to pass. So I can just, for example, copy and paste this into here, and then just to keep it clean, we'll name our variables. So this is a string, and it just wants the input file. And you can put an R before, and what that does is it makes sure to normalize um, the path based on operating systems. Okay, and then we can go R, and we'll choose our output directory. So we'll just put it in here. And we'll choose our file, we'll just call it fun.pix. 
and we're going to set this to an empty list. Okay, so we can now execute. Oh, it doesn't like. Ah, one of those simple user errors to make. You have to make sure to close your quotes. And we can run that one more time. And we now have our link file. So this file is basically, it's an, it's an imported PIX file of that original data, but it's a link. And now we can begin to use this to do, say, for example, photogrammetric processing. Like this now can store GCPs and it can store tie points a variety of different information. So we're going to build up from here now. Okay, so that's one way of basically uh, working with Python. Another such way of working with Python is directly in the command console. So we can actually just go type Python, because we have our environment variable set up as such. And if we click Enter, it's now going to go into the um, uh, the IDLE mode. And what we can do here is we can then do it line by line. So we can do import. And what I often do here is I might just want to test. So I can do something like import PCI. We can see if it imports successfully. If not, then we know there might be a problem with our licensing or environment variables. I can also do things like help pan sharp 2. And this will, oops, Actually, I have to do import sorry, from pci.pansharp2, import star, and then I can do help, help pansharp2, and now it gives me information, help information about this algorithm. So it provides me with the signature, which is what arguments need to be passed and what data types they are. It's expecting it also it gives me as I click enter, it gives me details about what the algorithm does. So this is just all very, um, oops, I went a little too far there. So it's just very simple ways that you can access it. So we're just going to leave this interpreter here. Of course, I should learn to spell. Okay. And then the final way that we can also run a Python uh, script is we can save it to a .py file just as a text file. So what we have here, and we'll just go back, just delete this file, is we have a very simple Python script that does two things. One, it creates a link file similar to what, we sh to what I showed you earlier. And two, it runs the GCP collection on that link file. So we can then just to launch this, we can go once again to our console. We can type Python. We'll do a space. And then we're just going to drag and drop that script in here. We can click Enter. So it's already created the link file. And now it's going through the process. It takes a little bit of time. But it's going through the process of doing the GCP collection. So we'll just let this finish through. There we go. So it collected a whole bunch of GCPs now. And if we open up our link file and focus, if we go to our ground control point segment, we can, we can see, number one, that we have a ground control point segment, and we can view our GCPs, for example, as displacement lines. So we can see our different areas of our GCPs, and we can see how far it's telling us we have to pull the image. All right. So... Now, a good and important question is, is, it's great that we have this, but what do we do with all this information? 
or how do we begin to build our own scripts? So one of the ways you can do that is you can, if we just close this for a second, is we have many resources that we're beginning to put online. So uh, we'll be announcing our official launch of our GitHub page where we're going to have a whole bunch of example, uh, example code, uh, we're going to have reference documents, tutorials, a variety of different uh, pieces of information. And one very key piece, uh, a resource that's going to be very useful is the cookbook. So what this is, is it's going to be found on our GitHub page. It's not fully properly released yet, but it will be released shortly and we will send out an announcement once this uh, once it's released uh, in terms of our GitHub uh, page being completely uh, completely set up. And what this allows you to do is it just provides you with some very basic code snippets that you can then use and put into your codes. So these are recipes. These are cool or useful recipes that you might be able to take advantage of within your code base. So for example, if I want to do, say, GCP collection, so we can see that it found a some code with GCPs. So what we're going to do is we're going to basically um, incorporate batch geoprocessing. So we're going to work on, uh, we're going to take this piece of code, this recipe, which performs automatic GCP collection, automatically removes bad GCPs, and it does this for all the images within a folder. So if we want to do this, we can just open up Notepad++ or any text editor. We're going to create a new one, and I'm just going to copy and paste the text. I'm then going to save it as, and we'll just call it batch GCP, and we're going to make sure to save it as a .py extension. Okay, and now we can basically run the script, but we just need to make some few um, edits to it. So this is, this is the point of the recipe, is that you can take all the lines of code, and then you just have to maybe make a few edits here and there. For example, we're just going to change the paths to our input data, our input directory. It's so here, I'm going to point to my raw data. It's going to find all the RGB images within that folder, or within these folders. I can then make sure to have this folder my ingest. Okay, so I've changed that one. And I'm going to change my reference image. And finally, my DEM file. So if you hold the shift key and right click on it, it's going to give you a copy as path option. And you can just paste that in there. OK. And then the final thing here, I'm just going to change this to the ingest underscore link underscore file. We'll do that for here as well. And then I can change these. This is a rejection criteria. So I might just increase this just for just for fun here. Usually you'd want to keep that low. All right, so now that we have that, that we can then go once again to our command console, type Python space, and we can take our batch GCP script that literally we just created from nothing. And as you can see, it automatically found both images within here. So it found this image, and it found this image. So it was recursively going through. And now it's going to go through and automatically collect GCPs and remove the bad GCPs for this. And then from there, you can go on to do either a bundle adjustment, DEM extraction, orthorectification, and mosaicing. A variety of different tasks can be done after you've, after you've done this. So, the purpose, once again, 
I've shown you this is just to get you thinking about this page because there's going to be a lot of different capabilities on here. So we're going to have aerial photogrammetry, satellite photogrammetry, generic for those of you, so this is really meant for the GIS user who you know, gets random imagery here and there and it gives them a chance to correct it. Mosaicing, data transformation, um, analysis and processing, integration and, and as well as some completed uh, um, full workflows. So, as you can see, we have our GCPs, and it's going on to the second image now. All right, so we'll let that finish off, but we're running low on time, so we're going to go to our final and our main demonstration. So, this is for those of you, okay, and we're complete. So, this demonstration here is really meant for those of you who want to build and sell solutions to, say, mining organizations, forestry organizations, government organizations, whoever it may be. But you have specific, perhaps non-GIS, non-remote sensing users in mind that you want to sell um, GIS remote sensing solutions to, which means that you need to create results and outputs and make it very simple and automated so that you don't need to be a specialist in order to either um, run the, run the uh, workflow or to interpret the results. So you need to make it a final deliverable. All right, so let's look at our scenario. We have a developer of a construction site who wishes to acquire volumetric measurements of new and removed stockpiles uh, basically changes to monitor the changing in the site in order to analyze productivity. So we did kind of go over this in one of our past webinars, but we've added to it. So the solution is to acquire stereo aerial imagery of the site, either um, uh, from a, or it can be high resolution satellite, but in this example we're using aerial. And we're going to do it every month in order to automatically extract and compare the changes in the digital elevation model and then automatically calculate volume of new stockpiles. So we'll go into the workflow in a bit, but what I've done here okay, so I just have it open up a command line in order to show the progress live. Uh, however, if you build a GUI you don't need to have it, uh, it doesn't need to do that. You can have it so that it doesn't show up a command line at all. So we can now, what we're going to do is it's, we're just going to run this tool. We're going to, first of all, it's asking, and we're just going to keep this up because it acts as our progress monitor. So what it's asking for is our raw data. So if we go here, our raw data used to build our main DEM, our current DEM. So this is not even the DEM itself. This is just the raw data that's going to be used to extract it. So this workflow is going to do everything from basically the raw data. And then it wants our reference DEM, which is the raw data from the DEM from that we're going to compare with. And then it wants us to choose a file to define our area of interest or the area that we're going to be performing the analysis on. And then finally we're going to put it in an output directory. So we'll just put it here. And then I can click run analysis and it's going through and it's going to perform the whole workflow. And let's take a look at what it's going to do. Now as I said, you don't need to have um, this command console to pop up. I just wanted to show you that it's actually doing a lot of different work under the GUI. But while we run that process, let's take a look at what we're doing. So the first step that the code is doing is it's ingesting the raw data. And here, if you want to build this yourself, here are the key functions that I used for this. You can see they're geomatica functions. 
Afterwards, we extract our what we call our digital surface model for 2009 and for 2011. We can see how the construction site has changed. So we can see we have new stockpiles here. We have some that have been removed. We have an increase here, um, or a decrease rather here. And then we also have, for example, some minor changes here. This stockpile for the most part is the same, but it looks like it's changed a little bit, so we might be able to identify that. We have some new stuff here. So it's good that we can visually identify it, but we need to quantify this information. And then here are the two functions that we use, both Geomatica functions for our DEM extraction. And what we get from, and then the next stage after we have that, is we're going to calculate the difference between these two DSMs. So what we'll get is we'll get a result that shows us the difference in meters between our 2011 and 2009 DEM. And our function that we use for that is, that once again, a Geomatica function called chdetop. It's change detection for optical data. After the next part of the workflow is we extract the stockpiles. So we're automatically extracting areas where we have significant change and we're vectorizing them, we're digitizing them as polygons. So each one is a separate entity. And the function we use for that is XPolRAS. It's also a Geomatica function. At this point, we switch over to a little bit more using some ArcGIS libraries. So here, we're going to calculate volume. And it's a very simple calculation. We're just taking, we want the stockpile, each stockpile volume measured in meters cubed. So we just get the sum of the change in height of each pixel under a polygon. And we multiply that by the resolution of the pixel squared. And that will give us our volume in meters cubed. And what we get as an output is each vector, each polygon, is going to have the volume information. And the functions we used for that, as you can see here, we used two ArcPy, or spatial analyst functions, as well as a Geomatica function in order to do the volume calculation and um, apply it back to the vector, to the polygon. And then finally, we mapped our results out in ArcGIS. So at this point, we're probably nearing the end of this, uh, of this workflow. And I have it set up so that once the project completes or the process completes, our results will show up in ArcGIS. So we'll just wait momentarily uh, for this process to complete. It should probably just be another minute or so. And then while we do that, we can just take a look at the source. So, you know, this, the point of showing you this is really just to show you that, number one, it's not that complicated, but because we're building a GUI on top, there's a lot of things we can do in order to create some very useful scripts and very complicated. And there's a lot of error handling in here. So, should be on the final one. Let's just also take a look at the outputs that it's creating. So everything's going into the working directory. Just give it a moment. Okay, so it's just finishing up now. So now it's opening up my ArcGIS project. All right, and then this is what I get as an output. So as we can see here, we have our construction site. We have our stockpiles that we extracted. 
and if we use this information button, we click on a different polygon, we can see that provides us the, the area, the perimeter, and the volume of this of each stockpile. And then, so we get this for each of them, and what's also quite nice is that if we wanted, we can extend this further, and we could generate a report from that. So we could have a, for example, for the non-GIS user, we could have it so that it creates a PDF report and shows basically where the new stockpiles are, the coordinates of them, uh, explains the, you know, provides the volume and the height and all, all this kind of information that uh, users may want and can provide it all in a, in a PDF report. All right, so that's pretty much, uh, that's pretty much the demonstration. So I hope at this point you were able to uh, get some useful information about how Python can be very useful and how it can allow you to create solutions for the non-GIS remote sensing user, allowing you to reach a larger market. And then you can also take advantage of a much more powerful set of tools as you can use a variety of not just what are strong tools, but strong tools from, say, ArcGIS or other uh, packages. So with that, I'm going to pass it back over to Jason, and we'll close up the webinar. Excellent. Uh, thank you, Sean. Yeah, just, just keep your screen going there. No need to pass it on to me. I just want to talk to people a little bit about, uh, you know, how to, how to contact us while uh, some, some questions do uh, trickle in. Um, right now, uh, I just want to mention that, uh, yeah, there we go. Um, if you liked what you saw today, um, by all means, like I said, you can visit our website at PCIgeomatics.com. Um, the, uh, the, the great opportunity for you to be able to, to, to download the trial if you don't have Geomatica 2014 installed yet is visit getgeomatica.com. And um, by all means, also from that website, you can check out all the previous webinars uh, that I discussed earlier. Um, I do have a, a question here. Sean, I'm going to let you, you handle it. I think I'm pretty certain of the answer. Um, the question is, um, the, the user, for those of you uninitiated, we do have another software product uh, that is our, our high production, high capacity uh, ortho and mosaic tool, the, the Geoimaging Accelerator, or GXL. And uh, the, the, the questioner here is wondering if, uh, if, if Python can be used to create workflows in that software product in addition to, uh, to just Geomatica. Um, I personally don't know of any plans to implement that yet, but uh, Sean, perhaps you can clarify? Uh, so the, basically the way it works is, you know, GXL is our uh, high performance processing system and uh, it's, it's, more of a, it's more of a complete system than, than Geomatica. Um, so what that means is that as of right now, Jason, you're right, like we don't have a direct uh, API, uh, well, we don't make it available for customers by default, but we do actually, we work with customers and because GXL is a solution that we provide, um, if it's important to the customer that they have the ability to uh, access and build their own functions with Python, and we do have a few customers who do have that, uh, then we do, we can make, yes, we can make it available for the GXL as well. Um, however, you know, that does require, um, a, you know, discussion from a sales perspective as to, uh, you know, whether or not, you know, uh, there's customizations that are required or, or how about we're going to do that. So it's a bit of a business discussion, but uh, yes, it is possible to uh, provide a Python API with the GXL, but no, we don't do it by default or it's not directly out of the package um, as it is with Geomatica. Excellent. That's a excellent answer, and it brings me to a point that I should have mentioned earlier. Um, I'm just going to talk somewhat slowly here, waiting for uh, maybe another question or two to trickle in. But uh, this is our internationally timed uh, webinar. We will be doing this again later in the day, but uh, knowing that we've timed this for uh, parts of uh, Asia, Europe, and, and Africa, I want to make sure that everybody visits uh, PCIGematics.com and up at the top of the page you will see one of the links says buy now and uh, what that will take you to is a map of the world where you can select uh, the country that you're in and uh, get put in contact with uh, either an authorized reseller in that region 
or the direct sales rep that happens to cover uh, your area. Uh, we do have uh, representation in uh, in all the uh, in basically every every country in the world, uh, give or take a couple. So um, yes, so um, uh, we, we'd like you to absolutely. Uh, check that out and uh, we'll be able our sales representatives will be happy to help you with any uh, purchasing decisions and putting together something that works best for you um, with that uh, I want to thank everybody for joining us we are getting some th some thank yous uh, sent, sent, sent in to us um, look for the recording to come out in the next day or so and uh, if we didn't get to your question because it came in at the very last second here we will also be able to answer that for you uh, as well so uh again thank you to Sean and uh thank you to uh, everybody for joining us and we hope to have you join us uh, uh again in a future webinar thank you again have a nice day everybody